All right, good evening, everybody. And it's good to have very few here tonight, but then again, we're all being socially separated. You know, that's one thing about being sanctified, we're separated, amen? Yeah. All right, let's all stand, turn to hymn number 22. Christ is all I need, number 22. Christ is all I need, Christ is all I need, all I need. Christ is all I need, Christ is all I need, all I need. need. Let's do verse 2 also. He was crucified for me. Died on Calvary. Then my soul, this is why I know Christ is all I need. Amen. Let's go over to number 147. Oh. Are you ready for this, Mrs. Echoes, or do you want to change it? Are you sure? Are you positive? I'm not. (laughs) Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Four. So are we now where Christ has led? Alleluia. Falling our head. Alleluia. Made like him, like him we rise. Alleluia. Ours across the grave, the skies. I got through it. I can't even believe it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for all that you've done for us. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct everything that's said and done here tonight. It'll be for your honor and your glory. We love you. We thank you for what you've done this morning. Thank you for the sunrise service and the number of people that were here and the number that watched online. We just pray for the ones that are watching online tonight, Lord. I just pray that you guide and direct them, be with them. I just pray now that you'll help us and guide us in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> All righty. Um, let's go to number 152. See if I know that one any better. Not much, but we'll make it. <coughs> oh, in the grave he laid Jesus. My Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph over foe. He arose a victorious from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. 
Vainly they watched his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they see the dead, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with the triumph over foes. He arose victorious from the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot <clears throat> his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. From the grave he arose with the mighty triumph over foes. He arose it in the dark domain and he lived forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Amen. I'm glad God, that we're through them. <laughs> <sighs> them high vo them high notes just get me and I didn't wear tight no I didn't I didn't say that <laughs> anyway <laughs> but it's good to have everybody here tonight I'll tell you what it uh, um, I'm looking for a great night tonight and and um, we got Sunday school at nine o'clock we got uh, Sunday morning worship at 10 um, Sunday evening at five o'clock Wednesday evening at six o'clock um, every morning at eight o'clock I'm doing a devotional on the internet um, it's um, for the school kids, but everybody's invited to uh, watch it. We've been having uh, up to 200 views a day uh, on my devotional, Monday through Friday. And uh, the devotionals are really good. And, and um, if you want to tune in, uh, tune in to FlorenceBaptistAcademy.com uh, on the Facebook. And then after it's on Facebook, Dana puts it on the uh, on uh, the YouTube and then also on to the school website. But um, if you want to tune in and watch that, it's great. It's a good time of, um, of refreshing and, and all kinds of good stuff there. But um, we've got Men's Fellowship, the 25th, 26th is Noisy Bucket, and the 26th uh, has also uh, been canceled for our first quarter business meeting. We're going to have that sometime in May, and we'll let you know on that. What? Yeah, we, we're going to go shooting. We have plenty of social distancing out there. You know, we got to be at least one gun length apart. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you know, there's nothing ba You know, there's nothing that kills the coronavirus more than gunpowder. Amen? Burn gunpowder. You know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I got one too. But, uh, you, know, it, you know, it's the gunpowder that, that takes that away. And um, so um, uh, we will be uh, shooting on, on the 25th. But uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, Brother Miss Eccles, I want you to come up here for a minute. <coughs> Welcome over here. You don't have to over there. Okay. Okay. There I am. Okay. Well, you know what? This is from Florence Baptist Church, and we want to let you know how much we appreciate you. I mean that a lot. We're going to miss you guys so much. You have no idea. And, um, you know, I just, uh, you know, God brought you here for a reason, and he's taking out for a reason. And uh, I know. <laughs> and I'll have Lucy over to your house at the end of the week. But anyway. Yeah. So, but God bless you, and uh, I'll tell you what, you always got a home when you come back. So just remember that. We miss you all. Amen. But um, now I'll get my tears dried off, and we'll be all set. All right, let's all stand, turn our hymnal to number 297. Nothing is 
is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in his word. Hearken to the voice of love to thee. Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon his word. So everything, oh everything, yes everything is possible with God. Let's wave and say hi to everybody. And uh, all right. Let's have an usher up here real quick. Brother Echo, as long as you're right there. And um, we'll pray. Go ahead and pray for the offering, would you please? Heavenly Father, we love you, and we just thank you for your great love for us. And we ask that you'll bless the service tonight. Bless those that are able to give. Please bless those that are not, and bless them in such a way that they can. We ask now that you meet the needs of church, and that your will might be done and be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'll turn their hymnals one more time to number 150. 150. I stand in need of the Savior in whom I rest alone. He lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. Ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving. And though my heart grows weary, I never despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. Well, I sure hope the Lord lives within your heart because he does mine. And I'm dropping stuff all over everywhere. All right. Now. Turn in your Bibles tonight 
We're going to be looking at two different passages of Scripture right off the bat, and then we're going to get into the message a little bit. And um, I'm going to give you a little bit of insight. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Um, the reason I'm writing this message is the other day I came in for uh, devotional, and I'm standing up here. We had all the chairs set up at that time. And uh, I'm looking across the auditorium, and I'm seeing all these empty chairs. And I'm thinking to myself, what's it going to be like once the Cronola virus is over? What's going to happen when this coronavirus is completely, is, are people going to come back to church, or are we just going to have empty chairs? This message is basically for the future, but it's something I think needs to be preached now so that people think about it. You know, this being Resurrection Sunday, and it should have been one of the largest church attendances in the year. In fact, most churches say that an Easter Sunday is the largest attendance they ever have. <clears throat> and most churches in the United States were shut down. There was no church. They didn't have any church. Oh, they might have had online like we have here. But they were completely shut down. There was nobody in the church. And um, I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, what, what will happen after this is all over? Will people be so accustomed to just staying home and watching it online? Or will they want to come back and have fellowship in the church one more time? You know, um, it, it's really kind of bothered me. It did. And, and I, uh, I was reading uh, the other day in, in uh, Luke chapter 14, and, I, and as I go through this, you're going to see where I am on it and why I'm doing what I did. But in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 15, it says, And one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things. He said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bed, bed, bade many, <clears throat> and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one accord, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go to see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that the servant came and, and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out uh, into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall uh, taste of my supper. I just want to read one verse real quick uh, in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 14. It says this, for many are called, but few are chosen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Done for us. I thank you so much for this church and the people. I just pray for those who are watching online tonight that they might get something out of this message that they can use in their own lives. I just pray that you'll be with us, guide us, and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, if you were to go into the book of Matthew, that one verse that we read, and you go previous about ten verses, you'll see um, um, the same parable 
that Jesus gave in Luke uh, chapter uh, 14. And what we need to realize is this, is that if you see it once in the Bible, you need to believe it. But if you see it twice, you better take it to heart. You know, as I looked over the auditorium the other day, I could see just empty chairs. The last three Sundays have been really kind of slim picking, amen? I mean, you know, we've had a lot of empty chairs because of this goofy virus that's going around. In fact, you know, um, you know I, and as I looked over the chairs, I could see people where they sit every Sunday and they weren't there. You know, but why will there be empty chairs after this virus is over? You know, I, I got to thinking about that as I was doing this message, and I'm thinking to myself, how many people are going to come back after this is all over? How many people are going to be here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, after this virus is completely over and they give us a green light to go back to the way things should be. I want to look tonight at this passage of Scripture a little bit in depth, and I want to show you what happens with empty chairs. There's <clears throat> there were many who were called. Look at verse 16 again. We're going to go through this passage in Luke chapter 14. So just keep your Bible open there. But it says, And he said unto him, A certain man had a great supper and bade many. What I see here is that this man bid many people to come to this supper. He had his servants go out with invitations. I'm sure there was beautiful invitations made out to all these people to come to this supper. You know, I believe that he gave a universal invitation to all the rich and famous to come to this supper. After all, he was a king. He could take and do whatever he wanted, but I believe that he had a great amount of people who were invited to this supper. I believe that he invited all of his rich friends and all of his rich relatives to this supper. He invited those who he believed deserved to come. I believe that he invited everybody that he thought was deserving to come to this supper. The man had all the chairs set up. Now think about this for a minute. Here's this rich man. He's going to have this banquet. He's got this big banquet room. He's probably got tables set up in this banquet room. He's got chairs set at every table. And those t chairs are probably all set in. He's got everything ready to go for the banquet. Everything was there. Everything was ready to uh, uh, happen with this banquet. You know, here we see all the chairs were pushed in and everything was all ready to go. And there might have been a little invitation or little name tags at every, every seat, you know. But then they were called, look at verse 17, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are ready. Everything was ready. The food was all cooked. The table had been set. The glasses were placed where they need to be. There was water put in the glasses. The chairs were all placed just perfectly in order. And everything was ready for the supper. The man told his servant to go and call all those that they had invited. Go out and call all those that were invited to come. I want to have my banquet table full. I want these people to have a good time. I want them to come to this banquet. These servants may have went out with a trumpet and blew a trumpet before they went. After all, this was the king's banquet table. After all, this was the king having this. More than likely, they went out with a trumpet and blew the trumpet and called everybody to come. Kind of reminds me of the rapture, doesn't it? All of a sudden, there's going to be a blast of a trumpet. There's going to be a shout. And the 
dead in Christ is going to rise first, and then we are going to be caught up to be in, in uh, the clouds with him. What we need to realize is this, is that the people were to come to the supper because it was ready to be eaten. It was all ready. Everything was ready to go. But you know what? They had excuses. Look at verse 18. It says, And they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said, I have bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. You know, the thing that I find very interesting about this one verse is this. Notice the first sentence in there. And they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. Now, I don't know if these people that were invited to come had had a little meeting and said, hey, you know, I'm not going to go, are you? I'm not going to go to the king's banquet. Are you going to go? You know, I can see it happening. I can see where all of a sudden they go, well, I'm not going to go if you're not going to go. If you're not going, I'm not going. Have you ever heard that? I have. I mean, I've heard that. Well, if, if you don't go, Chuck, I'm not going. I guarantee it. You know, they were making excuses all together in one accord. You know, there are many times I don't want to go someplace, you know, and I can make excuses why I don't want to go there. But, you know, when I go there, many times I get a blessing out of going. You know, each of these people had a different excuse why they could not come to the wedding or to the uh, uh, banquet. You know, but it's interesting that they did not say, I just don't want to go. I just don't want to go. I don't like your food, okay? You put on the worst entertainment there ever was. I don't want to go. You know what I mean? They didn't do that. They did not just say, no, I don't want to go. They had to come up with an excuse why they did not want to go. You know, many times in life, isn't that the way we are? We have to come up with excuses why we don't do anything. You know, it, many, it reminds me of a lot of people today. You know, if you take and you talk to somebody about getting saved, a lot of times they'll say, well, I really don't want to get saved today. I'll wait. I, I, I don't want to go to church today. Or they'll say, hey, yeah, I'll be there Sunday. I'll see you Sunday morning. And then they never show up. Now, which is better? To have them say, well, you know, I really don't want to come to church on Sunday. Or, okay, I'll see you Sunday. And then they don't show up. Which is better? You know, let's face it. At least somebody who's who tells the truth is going to tell you, no, I'm not coming. But those who say, yeah, I'll be there, and then they don't ever show up, are nothing but a bunch of liars. Right. You know, no one will have the same excuse as to why they can't be where they need to be when they need to be there. You know, <clears throat> if you ask them to come to church, they'll make a hundred excuses why they can't come to church. You know, let's take a look at their excuses, shall we? Verse 18, it says, one, um, The first said, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Now, his excuse was that he had bought a piece of ground, and he wanted to go take a look at it and see what it looked like. Now, if I was going to buy a piece of real estate, I think I would want to take a look at it before I bought it. You know, I'll tell you what, you can look at all the pictures you want to on, on the Internet, but I'll tell you, I would want to take a look at something before I bought it. You know, if you're going to buy a, um, 
a piece of real estate or anything like that, I, I would take a look at it, especially if I was going to spend thousands of dollars for it. You know, I find something very interesting about this verse. Notice that he had to go and see it. He had to go somewhere to see it. It wasn't close to, in proximity where he was. He had to go and see it. Now, as I was doing this, I got to thinking about this. Now, today we've got the Internet. We've got all kinds of pictures you can take on your phone and things like that. This guy didn't have that, did he? He had to go and see it. Why? Because somebody had come from another area and said, hey, there's a piece of ground for sale over here, and you can get it at a bargain price, and this is what it is. He said, okay, go buy it. The guy went and bought it, sight unseen. Now, all of a sudden, he's starting to get a little worried about this land that he just bought, and he's going, hey, I better go take a look at this to see if it's worth what I paid for it. I mean, you know, he might get there and there's stumps all over the thing. It has to be cleared. Or maybe there's big rocks all over and he can't plant anything in it. He has no idea what it looked like. And yet he bought it. He bought a lemon, so to speak. Anyway, um, but if you take a look at that, it's a lust of the eyes, isn't it? He had to go see something. He had to look at what he had purchased. In, our, in the society we live in today, we have so much entertainment to look at that we do not feel it's necessary to go to church. We don't feel it's necessary to go to church. We can get entertained wherever. Oh, there's a football game on tonight, and I can't go to church because it's the Bears and the Packers playing. Amen? That's something to stay home for. You know... <clears throat> NCIS is on tonight. I can't go because it's their season finale. And I don't want to miss anything. You know, there's a polar eclipse going to happen, and it only happens every 10 years. And I need to stay home and see this. Oh, here's a good one. You know what? Country Thunder's going on. There's a country western singer going to be singing out there on Sunday night. And there's no way I can go to church because I want to go hear him sing. I can get you a CD. It is. It's the truth. You know, you know, I have, here's a good one. I have to meet my social group on the internet and I can't go to church. I have a group on the internet that we meet every night at 5 o'clock, and I can't go to church Sunday night. You know, many times we feel we need to see something instead of going to church. You know, this man made an excuse that he had to see something and could not give of his time to go to the banquet. He says, hey, he says, I can't go. I got to go see this instead. I have something more pressing in my life than going to the king's banquet. Let's take a look at verse 19. It says, Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. You know, this one had something to do. He said, I bought five yokes of oxen, and I need to go and prove them. The word prove means to examine. What he's saying here is this. I went out, and I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm hoping that I didn't buy a lemon like he did in his land. And I got to go out and examine them to make sure that they're able to do what I paid for them to do. They've got to be able to pull a plow. They've got to be able to pull a disc. They've got to be able to help plant. They've got to be able to help harvest. They've got to be strong enough to pull the wagons that they have to pull. I have to go and see these oxen. It reminds me kind of someone who buys a car, sight unseen, not knowing even if the car runs. You know, 
Here's a man. How many of you have seen that commercial where you can take and buy a car and it's in a... Uh, um, Carvana. Huh? Carvana. Is that Carvana? Anyway, uh, where, you know, I mean, can you imagine going up and saying, hey, I want that car right there. And all of a sudden they all come down and this car comes out. Yeah, I want that one. Yeah, I'll take that one. Yeah. Or you're on the internet and you go, hey, let's see, I want the fifth one there. And they bring it down, and then they deliver to your house, sight unseen. You've never driven it, you've never looked at it, never kicked it. You know, the one thing I like about buying a car is going out and kicking the tires. I do. I like going out and kicking the tires. If You know what? If you kick a tire and a tire goes flat, that's a good sign not to buy that car. It is, because more than likely, you're going to have to put four new tires on it. Not very far down the road. But <clears throat> here we see that uh, uh, he had to go out and prove these oxen. oxen. Uh, here's a man who spent a lot of money for five yoke of oxen. He needs to examine them to see if they're able to do what he wants. This man was more worried about the cares of this world than his eternal destination. He was more worried about what... He has spent his worldly pleasures on than the king had for him for an internal inheritance. You know, it's easy for us to make excuses why we should not come to church because we need to go and find the pleasures of this world. You know, I can guarantee the first weekend that they lift the ban on us being at home What's going to happen? You're going to see a constant parade of cars and boats heading for the lakes. I mean, it's going to be a madhouse on the lakes because everybody is itching to get on the lakes with their boats. You know, I mean, that and four-wheelers out in the country and things like that. But you know what? They won't give any thought at all about coming to church. And the last one, he had to love something. Look at verse 20. And the other said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. You know, I have no problem with people needing to have family time with their families. However, I don't feel that family time should get in the way of church time. You know, what I'm talking about here is this. <clears throat> it seems like in the society we live in today, every Sunday and every Wednesday night, there's baseball games, football games, soccer games. There's school functions that go on all the time that you have to take your children to instead of bringing them to church. I realize school no longer uh, looks at Sunday and Wednesday nights as church nights. However, I feel that we as blood-washed, born-again believers need to step up and say, no, my child is not going to play on those nights, Amen. period. Amen. You know, I have no problem with, with family time, but I am having a lot of problem with fundamental independent Baptist churches right now. And I believe wholeheartedly that God brought this, allowed this virus to come in for one reason. And that reason is this. You can have all the family time you want right now. You take your kids and do whatever you want to with your kids because you're locked up in your house. Too many fundamental independent Baptist churches have quit having Sunday evening services at least once a month, sometimes twice a month, in the name of family time. You know, let's face it. Church is church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That's church. Three hours a week. Big deal. You know, most people say, well, you know, I got to have that time. It's Sunday. I got to have that time with my family. I got to have the family time. Hey, 
Saturday works good. Friday nights work good. What about them? What about Sunday afternoon? You know, I know of, of people who have left churches because they've canceled their Wednesday evening or their Sunday evening services. I know that I know families that have left churches because of that. Because Sunday is a time to go to church. You know, let's face it, there's too many churches today that feel, well, you know what, we're going to be a social club. Come on in, we'll give you a flowery message and you can leave feeling real good and that's it. That's the way it is. You don't step on my toes and I won't step on yours. Okay. You know, our younger generation does not feel that it's important to go to church. And the reason they don't feel it's important to go to church is because they've never trained that way. When I grew up, and I've said this many times, Sunday morning, you better be in Sunday school and church. When I got older, when my wife and I were married, you better be in Sunday school and you better be in church. You better be there Wednesday night. I can remember one Sunday, night, one Sunday morning, my wife and I, we went to church, and we got all done, and we went out for dinner, and we went home. And, and I'm sitting there watching TV, and I thought to myself, you know what, I'm not going to church tonight. I'm going to stay at home. Now, you got to understand, we're married. We've been married for over a year. You know, we got a life of our own. All of a sudden, I went to the door, and there stands my dad. I said, yeah, what can I do for you? He said, I just wanted to see if you're dead. I said, what? He says, you weren't in church. I said, oh. He says, you better be there Wednesday night. You understand? I said, yes, sir. You know what? That was the last time I ever did that. That was the last time that I ever skipped church. You know, because there's only two ways that you would ever get out of church. Number one is you were dead, and your coffin better be there. And the second one was that you were dying in the hospital and ICU and you had no way of getting there. Those are the only two excuses that you ever had for not being in church. You know, <clears throat> but you know what I see? I see that these excuses really bothered the king. If you take and you look at verse 21... Uh, let's see, let's go down to, yeah, verse 21. So that the servant came and showed the Lord these things. Then the master of the house being what? What's that next word? Angry. Angry. Said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes and the city and bring in the hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. He became angry. Why did he become angry? Because it wasn't because they didn't come, no. It was because they're stupid excuses. That's why he got angry. You know, our younger generation doesn't feel that they need to go to church because it's not entertaining to stand, sit in there and listen to an old man like me stand up here, holler and shout and yell and scream. But you know, there was many other invited. We just read that. Look who was invited. He had the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. You know, the king had prepared a lot of food. He had a lot of chairs set up for the people to come and enjoy what he had prepared. All he had invited had excuses why they could not come, and there was empty chairs. 
He tells his servant to go out to the poor, the crippled, the blind, and those who could not walk. Go out and bring them in. Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Here we see the king sending his servants out to find the poor, those who would not necessarily be invited to anything. You know, they're the food bank people. They're the ones there in the food bank line. Those who were, uh, would not necessarily be invited to any event that the king would have to come and join the king at what was going on. Many of these who are now invited may not have even felt worthy to attend because of their social status. They may not have ever been asked to attend a banquet in their entire lives, much less to come in the presence of a king. It's much like many today, isn't it? Many are called, but few are chosen. You know, we go out soul winning. We talk to people about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We give them the free gift of eternal life, and many times they turn it down. This is the interesting thing. Look at verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. And yet there is what? Room. And yet there is room. The servant comes back and he says, hey, we did everything you told us to. We went out and we got all the street people in here. We got all the crippled people in here. We got all the lame people in here. We got the blind. We got everybody we could possibly find. And yet there is room. Yet there's still room. There's still room at the table. There's still empty chairs at the table. What do you want us to do? Well, let's take a look at the next verse. Verse 23. And the Lord said unto the servants, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Wow. Listen, the king says, I don't want anybody. I do not want anybody not invited to my banquet. I want everybody invited. If we've got empty chairs, I want everybody invited to the banquet. The servant was told to go and find anyone he could possibly find and bring them to him. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The king did not want anyone to be left out. The king wanted everybody to know that they were invited to the banquet table. This is how God is towards us. He wants none to perish, but all to come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, it's not the desire of God that anyone should go to hell. God does not want anyone to go to hell. Hell was not made for us. Hell was made for the fallen angels. But everyone should be able to go to heaven. God wants all the chairs in heaven filled. He wants everybody to come to him and be part of his banquet. Those who refuse to come are going to be lost. Look at verse 24. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. What a sad commentary this is, that all those who have been invited to fill the chairs at the banquet feast in heaven have excuses why they can't come 
and they're going to be lost for all eternity. God will call everyone to come and to fill the chairs. But if, he, if they don't come, he'll be forced to let them go. He will find someone else to fill their chairs. After all, many are called, but few are chosen. What we need to realize is this, that <clears throat> each of us have been invited to fill the chairs. Each of us have been given the same opportunity to accept the free gift of salvation and to have a place at the banquet table which is set up in heaven. All any of us have to do is accept that invitation. Accept the invitation to be saved, and our chair is going to be filled in heaven. If we refuse and make excuses why we can't fill the chairs, we're going to be lost for all eternity. What's going to happen after the quarantine on families? What's going to happen to the chairs in this auditorium? Are they going to be filled? Or are they going to be as empty as they are now? That's up to you. It's up to everybody who's watching and everybody who's a member of this church. You know, what about you today? Are you filling the chair that you need to fill? Or are you making excuses why you can't fill that chair? Are you saved? Are you on your way to heaven? Are you ready to be sitting at the banquet table that the Lord has prepared? Or are you making excuses why you can't go to the banquet table? Oh, I'm too busy. There are too many things I want to live for. There are too many things going on in my life right now. I just don't have time. Well, friend, let me ask you something. When will it be too late? When will it be too late? When will all of a sudden that trumpet sound, there's a shout, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will be caught up in the air. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to sit back and say, wow. What kind of an excuse can I use now? But it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. We need to make sure tonight that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we were to die, we'd be absent from this body and present with the Lord. Make sure your chair is full in heaven. Make sure your chair is set at the banquet table because the king is coming. And I'll tell you, it's going to be a great great day. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for this message. I pray, Lord, that we might have full chairs. I just pray that when this is all over, that the church will flourish and that we'll have many coming back to church again. And Father, kind of lonely not having anybody in the church. And we just pray, Lord, that you take and guide and direct us. Help us, I pray, in all that we do. I just pray now that you'll continue to be with us and help us and guide us. If you're watching tonight and you're not 100% sure that you're safe, you need to be tonight. It's very easy. All you need to understand is you're a sinner, that Jesus paid your penalty on the cross, that um, <clears throat> you need to take and accept him as Lord and Savior. And if you do that, I guarantee that your chair will be full in heaven. All right, let's all turn to hymnal number 157. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left 
a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change a leopard spot and melt a heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin it left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Father, I want to thank you so much for today. We thank you for all that you've done for us. I pray now that you'll go before us. May your grace be upon each and every one of us as we leave this place. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct us. Help us to be testimonies for you. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. I just pray that you'll be with the echoes as they move to Michigan. I pray, Father, that you'd be with them, guide them, and direct them. I just want them to always know that we'll love them here. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed.